Marketing Dividends, presented by the Australian Association of National Advertisers. Inspiring, responsible, innovative and respected marketing. Hi, I'm James Hire. Welcome to Marketing Dividends. We're back for 2018 in Adelaide to talk about beer, budgeting and bikini bodies. For the panel this month, we've gone right to the top. All very different companies, but with one thing in common, marketing at their core. It was 1862 when Thomas Cooper began brewing beer in the fledgling colony of South Australia. More than 150 years on, Cooper's is still in the family. With a huge investment in expansion, the group has brand extensions beyond the well-known red and green Cooper's labels and is the country's biggest Australian-owned beer company. It recently leveraged that Australianness to win a five-year deal as the exclusive supplier to the Australian Open. Tammy Barton admits she's a penny pincher, even though with 250 staff and 20,000 clients, she doesn't need to be. She started the My Budget business in 1999 from home and is now on the cusp of taking the business global. The two-time Telstra Businesswoman of the Year built the brand around her with TV ads and a huge referral strategy. If you haven't seen Kayla Itzinas doing squats, then you haven't been anywhere near social media of late. With fiancé Toby Pierce, the personal trainer used social media to build a worldwide online fitness phenomenon. Using social and data, the pair has captured the female 20 to 35 market, including Hollywood celebrities. In fact, Kayla is herself now a celebrity, appearing around the world at boot camps with hundreds of fans. This week, I spoke with the heads of Cooper's, Sweat and My Budget. Here's what we discussed. My clients are talking to me about this low growth world that we're in. But if I look at you, founded 99 and average 20% growth, it's not something that, that seems to be affecting your trajectory. I'm curious how marketing has contributed to that. Yeah. Well, marketing has contributes substantially to that. I mean, it plays a really crucial role in our business. If marketing performs, the business performs. It has a direct impact on our growth. And just to highlight and to give you an example, a couple of years ago, we launched a new campaign, the Schmickers most expensive campaign <laughs> we've ever launched. And from the week it launched, our leads actually started going backwards and we didn't grow for the first time in the history of my budget. <laughs> and it broke my heart, but six months later, after spending all this money, we had to pull the campaign and go back to our, our original format, which was using real clients, telling their real stories about a real business, how, how we've helped them. And the week that we relaunched our old testimonial commercials, our leads went up by 15%. We shot new creative, introduced our, made sure that our CVP, our customer value proposition, was prevalent in, those, in that campaign. And then when we launched them, our leads went up by 40%. So it's not that just that marketing has a direct impact on growth. It's the right marketing has the direct impact <laughs> on growth. Right. And, Glenn, if I look at 24 years of beer volume growth, but you've been around for 155 years, I mean, there must be an enormous amount of ad stock, equity that's already been built. How, how does marketing really contribute to a brand that's been around such a, a long time and, and would be something that is incredibly familiar to all Australians. Yeah. While it's familiar, James, it's, it's these days where marketing plays an even bigger role because we're up against giant international breweries, really big ones, that have a massive amount of money and a massive amount of marketing spend. So to us, the marketing became a, an issue that we had to be unique. We can't, couldn't be the same as the others. A bit like beer's beer, but what we did is we tried to make ourselves uh, different. And some of the best marketing campaigns we did were always unique and, and quite quirky. They were done by um, Andrew Killey and uh, Peter Withy at KWP, who we're still with and been with them a long time. We had to differentiate ourselves a little bit, but not take ourselves away from what the consumer saw as a beer drinking brewery. So it's, it's now more relevant than ever that we can try and control that position. Because if we don't control that position and we become just like the others, we will get murdered. They've got massive boxing gloves, we've got little gloves. And so in the end, we have to market, but in a unique way. Right, and talk about unique marketing. Toby, with your partner, Kayla, built an almost $100 million revenue brand seemingly overnight. Uh, 
Are you using the four P's? The four P's. Um, do, you know, do I need to tell you what they are? Could, could you <laughs> um, no, I think, um, well, whilst I think they're, they're definitely relevant, I think um, a lot of our, a lot of our decision-making processes is based certainly off of other things. So um, our, um, yeah, like holistic business decision-making process is actually based off of four pillars that, um, that we, we call feasibility, profitability, scalability and sustainability. Um, so whilst the four P's are important for certain pitching purposes and so on and so forth, we actually use those four pillars to mandate our decision making internally um, in relation to not only marketing but other business decisions as well. So um, as far as marketing goes in relation to our business, I mean it kind of yeah, fundamentally provides three, three, key, three key things and they're basically reach and awareness, um, an ability to push our messaging and branding and ultimately Supply, which is lovely, um, and uh, ultimately um, the ability to invoke an action or emit an action from a user, whether it be engaging with the content or actually making a purchasing decision. So, and those four pillars, do you, do you have to tick each of them off? Do you have to get them all right? Is two two out of four going to crack it? No. Um, the reason uh, that they're, we, we kind of explain it as four pillars of a house, or the, you know, the four four pillars within a house, and if one of them or two of them don't stand, then the house won't stand. Um, and the reason being, um, because of the way that they're constructed, they're all interdependent, like or dependent on one another. So, um, primarily, like if we were to run a campaign, for example, that was hugely profitable, that's obviously traditionally a good thing for business. Um, but if it's not something that we can sustain for a, a longer period of time, or ultimately something that's scalable, um, then we're not necessarily really interested in it um, because it's only a short-term win, and it's not something that's actually going to have a, a fundamental like change impact on the business. Like, yeah, you know, it's all good. To to run a, you know, a marketing campaign that gets 10 really profitable sales. You know, but if you're talking about 10, 1,000 a day, the 10 doesn't really actually move the dial. Um, so we're more concerned about the, the activities that we do satisfying those four pillars so that we know that they're making good, like holistic impacts on the business, not just you know, acute ones. And how applicable is what you're doing to other businesses? So can I mm. take this marketing approach and put it in you know, an analog offline brand or is it something that only works in the digital world? Um, no, I think it definitely, I mean, I think it, like, I guess without being blatant, I mean, I think it would probably work in almost any organisation in the world. However, in saying that, obviously the execution is going to differentiate quite drastically. Um, I mean, like, we're a primarily digital business, so obviously you can't use primarily digital strategies in an analogue business. Um, but like fundamentally that, that philosophy and that decision making process, um, I mean, it's, it's designed to mandate good long term like business decisions. So it's not just about social media or the internet or websites or whatever, it's for any business. I mean, you could be in manufacturing or beer making or fin planning or whatever, it doesn't really, it's not going to make any difference. It'll still, it'll still add a good long term value to the organisation. And talking about the long term, Glenn. Every time I think about longevity, I think of you <laughs> and your brand. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I think of, of, of the, the, the legacy brands like Unilever and Procter and Gamble, th there's a way to, to, to market that they have, you know, created over the years. And, and I'm interested, is there a Cooper's route to market? Well, no, it's over that period of time, no, because it's evolved. I mean, you've got to understand one thing is that my great-great-grandfather, the side of the brewery, had two wives and 19 children. So that sort of messed it up right from the start. <laughs> so we know a little bit about a little bit of succession planning. Yeah. But what's happened during those periods is things have evolved through the generations and it's been the ability to react during those generations that's given us the longevity. So, you know, I can only talk from the later generation. But it's, it's an area where we believe that... Um, Personality plays a big part for us. Now, the reason I say that is because personality's always played a big part. We always said the Coopers. And, and, you know, my mother said to me, she said, don't be the Cooper that messes up the brewery, you'll get annihilated by the family. You know? So there's been this proud personality all the way through, and that's what's driven us to be able to do things that are, I'll say, right for the, for the time. The times change. Now, even now, we with social media... You know, things have changed totally. So we have, we have to adapt. The one thing I do say that we try and promote even more and more is the personality attached to the brand. 
I mean, without bagging too many other brands, <laughs> VB doesn't have a personality, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, so, you know, what we do is we've always made sure that our product has a personality and that's what we've worked on. So as generational changes occur and people's personalities change, we've tried to adapt to that period. I mean, personality f feels very emotional. Tell me, I'm interested in m modern marketing practices. Uh, I sort of picture you hugging and riding your dashboard as, as, as you're making decisions. You're a very different type of business. Obviously, you, you are a personality in your own right, but in terms of decision-making and using analytics to do that, how, how does that steer your business? Well, I mean, using analytics is really important for my budget to make decisions. I mean, anyone who knows me knows that the first thing I do when I get into my office in the morning, if I haven't already done it at home, is log into our dashboard and see how everything's tracking. And that really helps make decisions, but you have to couple that with your own gut instinct. And I say that gut instinct comes from really knowing your client, knowing your product, knowing what they want, knowing what their pain points are, and then being able to solve those, those issues for them. And once you know that and you combine that with the data, I think then you can make the right decisions moving forward. So, but absolutely, data and analytics are, are key. They kind of back up your gut instincts, I think. And um, I would choose my gut, though, <coughs> over analytics. So if, if the data is absolutely telling you to go one way, but your instinct is telling you not to do that, you will ignore the data? To an extent. I mean, <laughs> to an extent. But I, I would say if it's like 50-50 and you're unsure because the data is not giving you a clear answer, I would go with my gut. If the data is clearly saying something, then generally th that will persuade my gut anyway. Right. So, Tammy, you, you're, you're hugging your, your dashboards. Toby, I see you bench pressing the screens. <laughs> um, do, do you have coffee or do you go to your analytics first thing in the morning? I actually alternate between squats and bench press. <laughs> right. no, um, analytics are really important. Um, Kayla actually frequently reminds me that I'm a big nerd um, because I love numbers and I so frequently draw them on walls everywhere. <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, data for us is um, yeah is, is certainly really key. I think um, I think actually probably to give a story, I mean, I, I learnt um, fortunately in a really positive way that um, you know two key characteristics of data are, are, are fundamentally more important than anything else, and those two things for us are um, attribution and accuracy. Um, so obviously, accuracy of data is kind of I mean it's an, it's an assumed you kind of assume that it's accurate, but um, unfortunately, it's not necessarily always accurate, and it's sometimes open to interpretation. Um, so I think for us, like getting the accuracy was right um, right was definitely very important. But the next thing for us was um, the attribution. So um, probably without going and getting too in detail, um, which I do very often, um, is that um, yeah we because we're a subscription business and we operate digitally, everything is attributable. But how you attribute that data um, and how you determine which piece of marketing content is actually responsible for the sale is is very important. Um, when we when we had that discovery. Um, and we decided upon what our model would be and how that would work a few years ago, it meant that we were actually able to more than triple our marketing spend because we realised we were actually performing a lot better than what we understood initially, which therefore massively accelerated the growth of the organisation. So, I mean, that's a really interesting finding, mm. that your analytics actually realises the real ROI of marketing mm -hmm. and you're able to triple and hopefully still get a yeah. return? Yes, yes, <laughs> a big return still um, for now, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was uh, still very profitable, yeah. Stick around, more from South Australian's marketing giants after the break. Welcome back, I'm James Heyer from Wavemaker and on the panel this week we have Glenn Cooper, chairman of Cooper's Brewery. We have Tammy Barton, founder and director at My Budget, and we have Toby Pierce, founder again, and CEO of Sweat. All literally first moves into your category, albeit a, a, a bit earlier. Glenn, y you've had decades of craft beer leadership. I'm interested now how y your company is dealing with a category that, that feels Craft is everywhere, it's accessible, there's lots of variety. And are you caught in the middle, not big enough to deal with the behemoths you've talked about and not small enough for that new micro-brewer that's appeared? Yeah, well, we are to a certain degree caught in the middle. It's how we manage that position. 
I mean, give you a little example. The, the little pop-up bars, they say to me, oh, <clears throat> Coopers, you're too big to be craft. And I say, well, wait a minute, we started it. We're the grandfather of craft. So that's a frustration because it's a perception. <clears throat> so what we do is we've had to do some alterations. Now, people say to me, do, do we find cars as competitive? Not necessarily, because what it's done is grown the pie in, in what I call the thinking drinker. Whereas before, if we go back to our fathers and so, or mothers, you know, the, the guys that sit in the bar and one would drink two E's and one would drink four X and they would not swap and they would argue about which one was better. Today, the young people will experiment. Typically, research shows about seven different brands you'll play around with. Then you come back to some favourites. So that's what Kraft has done. So the pie's been grown, which is nice. Problem is that there's more competitors in the pie. We're in a strong position, but we've had to move a little bit towards making a crafty type beer. Now, when I say that, we've always made a crafty type beer. It's now perception. We have to market now to the people that say, this is a, this is a craft beer from Coopers. Wow, you know, we've, we're releasing a new beer called Session Ale, right? Oh, wow, a new craft beer from Coopers. You know, I'm not going to abuse them and say we've been doing it for 155 years, but look, if that's what, <laughs> that's what turns you on, great. <laughs> that's terrific. But we have to move ourselves a little bit to, to engage with this craft group. The worst situation is what's happening in America, where what's occurring now, the rows of craft beer are so prolific. There's like 4,000 craft breweries in one state. And they go with these weird bottles of every little label in the world. And what the consumer, what the, uh, the seller does now is he takes it out of the four pack, out of the and puts it in single bottles. So there's rows and rows of these weird names. Some of the weirdest names beers you've ever seen. And people go along with a shopping trolley and take one of those, one of those. There is no brand loyalty. They don't understand even who made it. So that's a dangerous position in my book as to losing the brand position because if that occurs, then the big supermarkets will have a ball because you lose your brand equity. And that, to me, is a very, very strong point that's got to be watched. It feels like the craft category <clears throat> becoming almost like wine. Lots I choose by label, and which is the funniest name. You do. <laughs> I need to talk to you after. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, Tam, <clears throat> the, the problem always being when you, when you lead in a category, show that there's growth and, and profitable growth. Mm. You have a lot of fast followers. How do you combat against the fast follower coming in and stealing a march on you because they're able to skip all the platforms you may have gone through previously? Mm. Mm. Uh, it's interesting you say that because this January versus last January, we've had a 350% increase on people bidding on our brand through Google AdWords. Um, so there's certainly a lot more, you know, fast followers popping up. I guess what works in our favour is we're dealing with people's money and finances and it's actually quite an emotional thing. So the fact that we have been around since 1999, and know it's nowhere near as long as Coopers, <laughs> but we've been around since 1999. We have helped nearly 75,000 Australians. We manage close to a billion dollars every year. That credibility plays a part. That combined with just making sure that you're, that you're always providing a premium service, that you're always looking at yourself and saying, how do I disrupt myself? How do we innovate? And, how, and never be complacent with the product that you're providing and say, where are the pain points for our clients? And always working to solve those pain points and just help people and help our clients as best we can. And that sort of is what keeps us at that, that forefront. So if I add something here just for a moment? What my budget being a financial budget is sort of a bit like, it's probably started out as a boring just, yep, it's boring. <laughs> helping, helping people do their budget. Sure, it's boring. It's, I've got a problem. What Tammy's done is she's attached that person, attached the personality that I talked about earlier to a product that can be seen as boring. She's attached with her name to that. And that would make a massive difference in how many people want to connect with her brand, too. Right. And, and I mean, one of the barriers <clears throat> to entry being trust, right? Mm. I mean, that, that's, it's, it's, it's mm. a very different category from a number of others. So is, is that one of, you think, the key barriers to entry for fast followers? Well, I, I mean, I think it's, a, I mean, when a client comes and sees my budget, at their very next, their very next salary will come into an account that we manage on their behalf. So you have to build that, that trust. And I think Glenn touched on a really um, good point, And that is, 
I personally humanise the brand, but if you go and speak to any of our staff, any of our employees, the feel on our website, on our social media, it is that we care about you. And that is actually one of our core values. And you can walk through our call centre and listen to our staff and people will go, wow, sounds like your staff actually care about the clients. <laughs> and I go, well, it's not that they sound like they actually care. They really, really do. That is one of our values. And we don't plaster it up on the wall. It's just who we are. We recruit for people who care, who want to make a difference in people's lives, who want to teach financial responsibility, not just want to come and work in a call centre. And trust being a barrier for entry. Toby, you know, my, my massive concern if I was in your shoes would be the low barriers to entry uh, in, in your industry, mm. where literally opening up an Instagram feed mm. and having a body not like mine, you can start a business. I think your body is uh, tremendous. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the, the barriers to entry feel really, really low. Fast followers mm -hmm. can come in there quite quickly. What, what is stopping them from usurping yourselves? Um, I mean... So they can kind of come and go as they please. Obviously, that's totally fine. I mean, at Sweat, we have um, we have uh, we kind of have two different types of competitors, and they're quite distinct um, in the sense that so we have we have businesses and brands that will come along um, that will launch their own app or their own series of products online, and then we also do have the individuals that will that will create a social media account and yeah put their tremendous physique um, <laughs> online um, and yeah attempt to distribute their content. I mean, I think I think for us, like we've we we have a couple of um, couple of different things and approaches that kind of I mean don't render that non-existent but help like maintain our confidence level and our I guess our prevalence in the industry and um, you know that being I mean I mean first and foremost we we have a whole bunch of proprietary technology and proprietary content that no one else in the world can have because it's ours. Um, so um, because of where we live in a content-based industry, if the content's what you want and we have it, nobody else can have it. It has to be something else, so it's ours. Um, and then I think as well, um, I mean, the, the fitness industry, much like many others, is, is definitely rapidly changing. Um, and, you know, the, the people who do maintain their position in that industry, and hopefully will be one of them, um, are the ones who not only use sustainable business operations, but ones who use sustainable marketing operations. Um, and what I mean by that is um, that uh, we're, we're quite focused on making sure that the purchasing decision made by consumers is a legitimate one. So to give an example, um, we're not in a rush to make money or in a rush to segment ourselves from competitors and whatever because ultimately we believe that when consumers buy our product, they're buying it for the right reason. So um, there was a, you know, once, and there probably will be again, there was a really great six-week ab program online quite a few years back that made a significant amount of money. But their, their big tagline was basically about, well, you know, I'll, I'll get you guaranteed abs in six weeks. Um, and the, the likelihood of that actually happening is obviously not necessarily that high. Um, so the person's um, you know, purchasing decision is quite impulsive. So the likelihood that they're going to spend money and then continue to spend money is obviously quite low. They're ultimately eventually going to get quite likely disappointed and then deviate to another product which has more sustainable results and is more trustworthy like ourselves because we take that sustainable marketing approach. So we'd rather not... We'd rather not you know, manipulate people or convince people based on impulse that they should buy. We'd rather educate them to make a legitimate purchasing decision so that their engagement with our product is realistic, which makes us a far more sustainable, trustworthy competitor and significantly segments us from the audience. We don't have consumers who come and go. We have consumers who come and stay. And that's it from Marketing Dividends this week in Adelaide. Join us later this month where we'll be filming in Perth. See you then.